Uh, we are in two places in our Bibles this morning. Uh, we are on page 995, so we're going to be dipping into Luke 19, which is the um, Palm Sunday. Um, but we're also going to be flicking forward uh, to page 1001, and uh, that's chapter 23, and we'll be uh, reading from verse 26. It's the beginning of Holy Week, it's Palm Sunday, Uh, we are giving it the theme Love Wins, as Jesus demonstrates his love for us on the cross, and yet that is not a defeat, it is the ultimate victory as on the third day, next Sunday, he is raised from the dead. And uh, what we're going to do as we read the text together is I want us to look at, in particular, uh, two of Jesus' laments, that's what I want us to focus our attention on. He weeps over Jerusalem uh, as he comes in on the donkey, and then uh, he laments from the cross. So uh, I'd love you to uh, just turn to page 995, chapter 19 of Luke's Gospel. And uh, Rick has already recounted for us how Jesus came in on a donkey, uh, the crowd shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, waving palm branches, throwing their cloaks in front of him. But Jesus' own experience is different to the experience of the crowds. And just turn your attention to verse 41, if you would. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come on you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground because you and the uh, the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And if you turn over to uh, chapter 23, page 1001, this is Luke's account of the crucifixion. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray, shall we, before we look at these passages together. Holy Spirit, come and open up your word to our hearts, we pray. Wherever we are, however we feel, whatever is on our minds. May these words become uh, living and active. 
May they cut right to the core of who we are and speak words of life to us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. In case you're wondering why it is we're uh, looking at the crucifixion today, it's because it's a simple reason, really. Uh, it's very easy for us if we are uh, if we're unable to come to a, a Maundy Thursday or a Good Friday service to uh, enjoy Easter and go straight from Jesus coming in as the triumphant King on Palm Sunday right to the resurrection on Easter Sunday, and you miss the crucifixion right in the middle. And uh, Luke's brilliantly helpful in this because he um, ties these two stories with these two laments that you will have heard as I was reading that. The weeping over Jerusalem in chapter 19 and then the lament from the cross. And so the two things I want us to look at are this idea that you did not know the time of God's coming to you, he says in chapter 19. And then in verse uh, 31 of chapter 23 where he says, if people do these things when the tree is green... What will happen when it is dry? And I just want to issue a health warning before we get going. That uh, this is a, uh, a dangerous sermon. It's a dark sermon, if you like. But bear with me. Because it is the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, but f- Sunday is coming next week. And then we're going to look at four parts Uh, This morning, we've got the initial diagnosis. Uh, We've got uh, Jesus is not the cure. Uh, You need shock therapy. And then fourthly, uh, there's my plea for you to get inoculated. So let's begin with the initial diagnosis. I wonder if you've been asked this question. What's your problem? It's often on the lips of a young person, isn't it, who asks it with a sneer. What's your problem, mate? Or maybe somebody's asked you, what's the matter? In a bit more loving tone, perhaps. Or, what's wrong? What's your diagnosis? I wonder, how do you respond when someone asks you that sort of question? Maybe you begin with yourself, where you are in your own life. And perhaps for you, the problem is a a, a lack of of identity. Perhaps you, you uh, you want someone to recognize who you are. Perhaps you're struggling with recognition or being different and excluded. Maybe the problem for you is significance and you are looking for a purpose in your life and meaning. What is it all about? Perhaps for you, the problem in life is boredom and you are just looking for stimulation and entertainment. Or maybe when you answer that question, you think on a, you paint on a slightly larger canvas and you think about the world and the problems of the world and your response is, well, it's intolerance. That's the problem, isn't it? Maybe you think of bigotry and even religion, perhaps, as the problem that the world faces today. Or maybe it's security in the face of terrorism and violence and war in our world. Or perhaps it's the reality of poverty and injustice, of inequality and environmental degradation. Perhaps those are your answers to the the question, what's your problem? For the crowds welcoming Jesus on that first Palm Sunday, they had a really clear answer to that question. They knew what their problem was, and their problem was occupation. Not what job did they do, but the fact that they were occupied by another power. They were occupied by the Romans, and so they desired deliverance. They longed for a a day of liberation, where they were set free. For them, you see, the Romans, the occupying force, they were the problem. And political freedom was the answer. That was their initial diagnosis. And they thought they'd found the cure. And they thought the cure was Jesus. But Jesus is not the cure, you might be surprised to hear me say. For them, they thought here was the promised Messiah. And their understanding of Messiah was that he was the king. He was the military leader, the ruler who would drive the Romans out. It's a bit like 
the, the old Celtic hope that one day King Arthur would come back and defeat the English. And what was amazing for them was that it actually had already happened a couple of hundred years before when they were occupied by the Greeks. A military leader, a guerrilla fighter, a terrorist, if you were on the other side, uh, rose up, a guy called Judas Maccabeus, and he actually successfully waged a guerrilla war and drove out the Greeks from Palestine. He rides into Jerusalem on a great war horse and he cleanses the temple of the pagan influence where a pig had been sacrificed on the altar. And he declares independence once more. And so if it had happened before, why not again? Why not Jesus? And so what do they do? They co-opt Jesus. They commandeer him for their own purposes. If you like, they hijack his agenda and try and place it within their own They use Jesus to solve their problems. They squeeze Jesus into their story. After all, he's the obvious answer. It's easy for them. But it doesn't work. Because he doesn't fit. Questions are already beginning to be asked at this point in the story. The Pharisees, who are kind of moderate nationalists, so they, they wanted independence, but they wouldn't, on the whole, uh, resort to violence to bring about that independence. Uh, they looked at Jesus and they thought, you're not doing what we would expect a Messiah to do. You're not enforcing the purity laws. You are not keeping the Sabbath You're not acting as a Messiah should be acting. Then there were the zealots. Now, they were the radicals. These were the ones who were willing to resort to violence. Judas Iscariot was one of them. They were the the guerrilla fighters, the terrorists, if you were a Roman. Why wasn't this possible potential leader, this king, fighting the Romans? Why was he instead rejecting violence? Why, when 200 years before, a great leader had come in on a war horse, was Jesus coming in on a donkey? That is not inspirational leadership, is it? You know, you want to be waving swords, not palm branches, if you're leading a rebellion. And their disappointment over this week turns into fury. Their adulation, their hope, their expectation becomes anger and they reject Jesus and they exact their revenge because Jesus isn't the answer to their problem. And that's because their diagnosis, their initial diagnosis was wrong. It actually ignored the real problem. They underestimate the seriousness of the situation they find themselves in. You see, the problem isn't the Romans at all. It's much worse than that. And they don't even know it. So they don't recognize the time of God's coming to them because their eyes, their attention, their focus is somewhere else altogether. But the truth is, Our diagnosis is often wrong too, isn't it? We do exactly the same as the crowds with Jesus. There might be different problems. It might be poverty or injustice or the environment or maybe the economic system or a lack of moral moral values. It might be bad government. It might be religion. Whatever it is, we think these problems are the real problems and that Jesus is the solution. Sometimes we might think, We can handle it with the next big idea. Sometimes we think we can handle it with the new piece of technology. But really, it's inspirational leadership. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for a hero. You remember the great campaign slogan of Barack Obama. Yes, we can. That resonates with every one of us, doesn't it? Until four years later, we ask ourselves, can we really The crowd wanted a hero, we want a hero. And so we co-opt Jesus to be our hero. 
because we think he's the one that brings us purpose, meaning, significance. He's the one that allows us to have a moral shape to our lives. He gives us a moral compass. He's the one who promises justice and peace. He brings experience and wonder. And we find that we have started to use Jesus to fill these holes, these problems that we have in our lives. And the problem is, is that leaves us uh, vulnerable to the accusation of philosophers like Alain de Botton, who's just recent, recently written a book called uh, Religion for Atheists. And he says, yes, religion deals with all these sorts of problems. And we need to recognize that it, it does that. But actually, you can create things that do all of those things. You just don't have to believe any of the religious stuff. And so Jesus just becomes one option in a marketplace where we're all trying to solve the same problems. But the truth is, is that these aren't the problems. These are just the symptoms. There is something else that lies underneath that goes much deeper than any of them. That's much more profound. And so we just need to say here, the the initial diagnosis, Jesus is not the cure. And what you really need is some shock therapy. Some shock therapy. You see, to recognize the uh, real problem, you first need to accept the futility of life. You need to embrace the meaninglessness and the hopelessness of life. And that is a really difficult thing to do. It's a difficult thing to preach from up here. Because it's too bleak, isn't it? It's too austere. It's tragic. It is too much for us to bear. And so we create fantasies instead. But we have to confront the world as it really is. We have to be brutally honest with ourselves. Rowan Williams, the outgoing Archbishop of Canterbury, said these words. It is only by looking straight into the abyss of the world's empty destitution that our illusions are burned away. It is only by looking straight into the abyss of the world's empty destitution that our illusions are burned away. And when we do that, it hurts. It is like staring up at the sun. It burns our eyes. It's disturbing. It's uncomfortable. It's not something we want to do. And that's where the shock therapy comes in because there's often these moments of intervention that hit us where the the veil is taken away and we stare at the sun for a moment and we feel the glare before we turn away. Where reality is exposed. Where we are confronted with how things really are. Just for a moment, it's like the flash of a flare that goes off before darkness descends once more. And there have been a few of those, I think, recently. The collapse of the footballer, Fabrice Mwamba. And the incredible outpouring of of prayer as people realized that life is fragile, that we are helpless. He was there one moment playing football and he collapsed. And he was dead for 78 minutes. And all we could do, all even the sun could do, was pray. Or the shooting of those Jewish girls. All of which the gunman filmed as he executed those children in cold blood. Or the murder of those 17 Afghan civilians by the US soldier. Or the torture of children in Homs in Syria. There are moments of shock therapy which shake us out of our fantasy world and think this is how the world really is. And the crucifixion of Jesus is Luke's shock therapy. uh, Luke says to us, time and time again, Jesus is innocent. He has three trials in Luke's gospel, three acquittals. 
There are two declarations of innocence. The thief on the cross uh, chastises the, uh, uh, the other one there with him and says, we are guilty. This man is not. He doesn't deserve what's happening to him. At the end, when he breathes his last, the centurion in Luke's account says, surely this man was innocent. He was a righteous man. And yet still he is tortured and executed. The system rouses itself and swats aside this threat. This is David and Goliath, but Goliath wins. There's this overwhelming, undeniable, unstoppable weight of both the state and religion that snuffs out this life. This protest is extinguished. It is swatted away. And we are left with a sense, a deep sense of injustice and helplessness and futility. It can't be like this. But it is. And it's only in moments like this when we glimpse for ourselves what the real problem is. That's why Jesus says, if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? God sends his beloved son to the creation that he loves. And still, Jesus is tortured and executed. He comes preaching the good news of God's grace. He heals the sick. He uh, uh, casts out demons. He forgives sins. The kingdom comes. There are signs of the kingdom all around. And yet, human beings still kill the Son of God. You see, the problem is profound. And the problem is within every one of us. Whether you call it the psyche or the self, your soul, your gut, your heart. The core, our very essence in each one of us, that is where the problem lies. We are the problem. You see, the Bible says that the heart is contaminated, it's polluted, and the Bible calls that infection sin, and it goes right the way down. So it impacts our, uh, our will, it infects our emotions, our feelings, our thoughts, our desires, even our instincts. It means that we are essentially selfish, and we are dulled to the pain of others, and this deep wound runs right through the center of our being. It's a rupture that is so profound that it has torn the very fabric of the universe itself, the very fabric of existence. It infects the human psyche, it infects our relationships, it infects society, it infects the environment. It is the ultimate contagion. It is the problem that every one of us has and it is a problem for all of us. And so you see that the initial diagnosis was, was way off and that's why Jesus isn't the cure. And it's only with shock therapy do we see the problem as it really is. And so we need to get inoculated. You see, the extraordinary thing in all of these events is that God remains relentlessly faithful. Do you notice here, Jesus' response to what is being done to him isn't judgment. It's not condemnation. This isn't the wrath of God being poured out. This is lament. This is lament. What we're seeing here is, is a deep sadness, a profound disappointment. It hurts. Jesus weeps because it hurts so much. There is this sad resignation in him that this is how humanity really is. The good news is that it's not his only reaction. 
he prays. And you have this uh, force of the drama, the momentum that is hurtling towards this tragic end, and suddenly it is broken. We are brought to this juddering halt by Jesus' prayer. And he prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Despite the the harsh reality of human depravity and selfishness, despite the deep wound that runs through all of us, despite the rupture that runs right through the center of the universe, God forgives. He doesn't walk away. He doesn't start again. He doesn't try and escape the torment. He endures it. And the miracle is is that God is made available to you and to me in that moment of darkness and dereliction. And it's only when we realise the depth of the problem that we all face, it's only when we realise that, that we understand how startling it is that Jesus can pray in this way. How can he pray? Father, forgive them. How is that even possible? Well, it's the cross that makes it possible. You see, the cross doesn't just expose the problem of the human heart. It offers the solution too. You see, God doesn't ignore the problem or kind of sweep it under the carpet. He doesn't pretend that it doesn't matter. He exposes the infection and he provides the cure. You see, the cross is the antidote. The human heart is contaminated. It is infected with a a, a profound sense of self, of alienation, what the Bible calls sin. And Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, the giving up of his life, is the vaccine. You know how a vaccine works? The pathogen, the disease, is uh, introduced into the bloodstream. It stimulates antibodies that cause an immune response, which enables the body to kick out the disease. So Jesus here is acting as the vaccine, as the antidote. He becomes the human being and he rejects autonomy. He lives a selfless life. And he endures all the selfishness, all the evil that humanity can offer. And he absorbs our sin. The Bible says he becomes sin for us. It's that extraordinary. And he neutralizes it in himself. He injects his righteousness back into the bloodstream. And so by the Holy Spirit, he changes our human nature. He regenerates the core of our being, our hearts. You see, the hope of Christianity is not that we can live a better life and solve those problems that are actually symptoms. It's that we can be given a new life that solves the problem. It is as dramatic as the resurrection of Jesus was. It places us in a new community, uh, surrounded by new relationships. And it begins the renewal of creation itself. So as we begin Holy Week, as we look ahead to the cross, to the resurrection, get vaccinated. Get vaccinated. Receive the antidote. And if you're not sure how to do that, the thief helps us look at him there he is on the cross still able to tell off the other thief hanging there who just is angry and just shouts accusation at Jesus and he has in his helplessness a moment of honesty as he recognises that Jesus is innocent but that he is not and we all need that same moment of honesty but he also trusts 
He trusts Jesus, which is an incredible thing to do if you think about it. Because Jesus is hanging there on the cross with him. And yet he utters simple words. Remember me. He can't do anything. He's utterly helpless. He gets it in a way that we seldom do because we always think we have something to contribute. But when you're hanging there and your life is ebbing away, all you can ask of someone else is that they'll remember you. And whether you have faith and you have been following Jesus for years or you don't have any faith at all, this is the place we all need to get to. A place of honesty and of trust. So just to sum up, we've looked at the initial diagnosis that focused on the symptoms rather than the actual problem. We recognise that Jesus wasn't the cure to those symptoms, that instead we needed shock therapy so we saw the problem as it really is, that we need to get inoculated. But how can we be sure that any of this is true? Why is this death any different from the countless other deaths where people were hung on the cross because the Romans didn't like them? Why is this death not just the death of another martyr, just another lost cause? Well, it's because it's not the end of the story. But if you want to know the end of the story, you're going to have to wait until next week. Let's pray. Let's just be quiet for a moment. Let's get to that place of honesty about ourselves and about the world that we live in. Let's try and stare at the sun, see things as they really are. Lord, it's only when we are honest and we realise the extent of the problem that we find ourselves in do we know that the only option for us is to trust you, is to say, Lord, remember me. We weep over this world as you did. Lord Jesus and we recognise that we can do nothing ourselves to put it right so we pray remember us Lord Jesus help us to trust you that on the cross You gave us the antidote that can make us well. So may we receive that afresh this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.